This summer, members of the Green Party of England and Wales will be voting to elect new members of their executive, commonly known as GPEX. Now, members of GPEX are elected to specific portfolios, and today I'm going to be speaking to one of the candidates for the Equality and Diversity Coordinator position. But before I introduce them, I just have one thing to ask of you, which is that you scroll down right now and hit subscribe. So with that out of the way, I'm delighted today to be joined by Kefense Dennis. Kefense, how are you doing today? Good. Very good day. Good, good. Glad you are well. So let's crack on nice and straightforwardly then with why are you standing to be the Green Party's next equality and diversity coordinator? Uh, there's three reasons, really. Um, the first reason is to make sure that the diversity matters report is implemented. Now, this is not going to be a small task. This is going to take a long time, especially if we want it to implement it in a way that is super effective. I'm not talking about one of those reports you just do within six months or a year is going to take quite a long time because you're talking about quite big changes of, of implementation within the party. It's, it's been broken down into five like work streams of different parts of the party as well. And there's going to be obviously an EEDI manager that's going to be um, run, running alongside me to help with this implementation. So that's going to be a long stretch that's going to go over and imagine at least a couple of conferences to really um, implement. Um, secondly, I want a, be a better um, monitoring of demographics in terms of those protected characteristics. Um, I don't think the Green Party has a great track record when it comes to knowing the, the different kinds of members it has. Um, I want to see a system where like, when you join up with the Green Party, you're automatically um, joined up with these uh, special interest groups. And when, once, well, if you choose to di divulge any protected characteristics, you're automatically added to their mailing list as such, but also it's just documented. I want to see that obviously retrospectively done through members who are already um, with the party as well. I want to see some sort of system where we literally do, we go through the 50 plus thousand members and try to just document the amount of, of, of those that have those protected characteristics. So we get a real true idea of how diverse the party is, where and where um, issues might arise or where there needs to be more support and where there's some interesting results as well in, in regards to that. So I think having something like that in place is, is gonna be really key. And the final thing, and I think for some people, probably the biggest thing, is I want a culture change in the way that the party is, um, especially when it comes to, how shall I put this? The divide, let's just say the divide in a PC term. Um, it's becoming so ingrained and cumbersome of everything within Green Party, I feel like from the very top to the very bottom, that it seems like at this moment in time, only two protected characteristics matter. And that's kind of jockeying for position to see who's the most important. And as a result of that, there's many others that get forgotten about. So, for instance, senior greens, we don't re we rarely mention senior greens, even though they're a significant member uh, of the party. There's there's many thousands of members that would classify themselves as senior greens, but we barely get promoted. There's barely any presence of them in social media, if I'm not mistaken. You could say the same for Jewish Greens as well, which is an unfortunate thing. Um, dis, uh, dis, uh, the, dis, uh, the um, disability Greens, um, you know, they need, I would say, probably um, a, a real consultation needs to be done with them because with, unlike the other protected characteristics, their, their um, ability to, leap, to either attend something physically or virtually really is dependent on how accessibility that thing is. So we're talking conferences, meetings of large kinds and things like that, um, you know, regionally or locally, depending on what kind of technology or if they can actually attend it in person is really down to how we implement that. So again, it's about making sure that all of the protected characteristics are equally heard, listened to and felt like valued as well. And that's like, uh, a thing that I feel like is a, being a byproduct of this large issue, which I've um, uh, said earlier about the major divide that's happening within the party. And it's it's creating a, a toxic culture as well of where 
I feel like people are just outright dismissing really good policies or dismissing really good groups or whatever things that people are bringing forward just because a certain name is associated. So I'm not going to join that person's thing because they're associated with that side or they're associated with that side. So I don't want to get involved in it. And it's which is really unfortunate because the point of politics is we're meant to discuss, we're meant to be getting together and deliberate and discussing ideas. And I feel like there's some people that don't even want to get into the room to sit down at the moment just because that person's inside the room or perceived to be on that side as well. So I want to really try to see if I can change that kind of culture within the party. So you touched on a lot of things I want to pick up there. Um, in fact, sort of all of my next three planned questions you've covered there. So I'll, I'll take them one by one. So let's start with the Diverse Matters report. So people watching may or may not be aware, but essentially about 18 months ago now, I think it was, the Green Party commissioned an external organisation, Diverse Matters, to produce a report on the party's um, performance on equalities issues, diversity issues, uh, oppression and so on. That report's been uh, produced and it's got a series of recommendations in it, um, which members will have seen the executive summary of. It was emailed round. Um, so for you, Kapensei, I just wanted to ask you, uh, how will you work to ensure that those recommendations are effectively implemented? Well, the first thing, we need to promote it. I will, I guarantee you that there's a lot of people in the party have never heard of this thing. So unless you're really like involved in that kind of sense of like what's happening in central or national party, whatever you call it, you probably never even heard of it. Like a lot of people, and that's, that's the thing, there's a, there's a massive gap between what people do at the local level versus what happens at the national level. Now, there are people that do both. So they're able to divulge that information, but we shouldn't be reliant on individuals to where, you know, divulging such information where it should be like a, a centralized system. So the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that all regions, therefore, hopefully it will trickle down to the local parties, know about this diversity report, making sure that all um, other special interest groups know about this report, making sure that anyone of any governance knows this staff members and such because it's an all-encompassing thing so if there's some people that don't know about it that is an issue because everyone should know about it so that's the first thing and then the second thing is making sure that obviously um see where we are with it in terms of the um e and d committee talk to obviously where we are in gpex now i've been, it's obviously been a while since i've been out the loop of gpex so i want to get back in and see where how far we are with that what has been done so far, what needs to be done. And also what does that look like having kind of the, you say, okay, I wanna get this thing done, but what does that look like when it's achieved? So making sure we're all, you know, moving in step when we, we see, when we tick a box and say, okay, that's done. What does that look like? And everyone understands what that looks like. So that's the first thing I would say is making sure everyone is fully aware of it, making sure it's promoted. So maybe even like, Again, if it needs to be mentioned at conference again, making sure it is mentioned at conference for everyone to be wary of that. But again, ch telling people regionally and other governance and organizational groups and making sure to see where we are um, with it, at, with its implementation as well. And so the other area that um, you mentioned in your initial response, um, well, you kind of euphemistically refer to it as the divide. Now, other people would refer to it and lots of our viewers would refer to it as a problem that the Green Party has with transphobia and with transphobia in the, the party's membership and a failure of party bodies to tackle that. So what I wanted to put to you is as Equality and Diversity Coordinator, how would you tackle transphobia in the Green Party? Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult thing and I um, really hope that with my approach, people don't um, take it as like they don't um, see it as a bad thing uh, or like I'm taking a bad faith, or faith approach with this but I want to make sure that we're all um, knowing the context of what is transphobia what does it look like what it is first of all because we need to make sure that we everyone is clear on what transphobia is and obviously no one in their right mind wants transphobia to happen within the party. So that should be obviously eradicated, just like any other discrimination against any other protected characteristics, first and foremost. But secondly, I feel like 
And again, people might disagree with me on this. And the point is we meant to deliberate, have a conversation, make sure that we're all coming from different, um, we might be coming from different um, sides of this, but making sure that we're all understanding each other on this is um, people might be a bit worried about asking certain questions or saying certain things or producing certain things and being worried that they're seen as transphobic as, a, as opposed to saying that when initially they're just being um, maybe ignorant, maybe they're just curious. So again, a, a space needs to be created where if people want to ask those kind of questions, they're not suddenly going to be jumped all over, suddenly attacked because they're just asking a question because they might not be um, privy to the information. They might not be fully um, wary of what's happening within the party. And I want to separate that, which is very important, from those who are just never going to change their mind. Now, I feel that has to be said because there is a reality of, and I feel like there's a spectrum of people that are kind of like, you got people that are just not going to change their mind on it whatsoever, no matter how much information, no matter how much data you bring towards them. They're never going to change their mind. And I'm not speaking to those people because they're not going to change their mind. What I'm going to be speaking to is probably those more moderate people who feel like they can be changed, they can be spoken to. You can have a one-to-one -one conversation with them and generally um, have a nice dialogue about where they're coming from and the kind of issues that they're having. And I feel like that's the majority of it. But unfortunately, it's, it really becomes that kind of polarized thing of you can't even ask that without feeling like, well, what team you're on? What colors are you representing? You can't even have a thing where at conference, then the two tables can't even be near each other because there's a feel like there's an argument's gonna break out or or maybe even something more if, if that's the result. So I feel like we need to really sit down and, and get down to the, the 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 bare bones of that. And I saw that there was a motion at Spring Conference about the was it the healthy toolkit um mm -hmm. motion. And you know, um I don't know if you were there, I think you were there, Chris. I don't know if you were, but I stood up in the plenary and said, this is a this is a really good motion. This is all good and all and this is the kind of dialogue I want to see. But unfortunately and again, ironically, due to the, the fact that the names on this, um, as proposers on the motion, they're not going to be happy with co-signing this because they feel like their their people, air quotes, is not going to is not going to be on there. So I stood up and said, let's recall this, let's get people on both sides as a divide, as I say to uniformly push this together so this is seen as a truly unifying motion where people of all kinds can get together and really try to tackle this issue that's happening within the party now that fell um i mean for me obviously that was unfortunate because i i called for that but there were people after that and um, when the plenary finished that congratulated me because they felt like you know what fancy I was too, I, I understand what you're saying and I'm too fearful to say what I feel because if I put my head above the parapet, I feel like I'm going to get hit. And that's where we are at the moment. There's, um, you know, you could say there's vocal minorities that are shouting a lot, saying things that not might not necessarily be the consensus of the majority. And there's a lot of people that are not saying anything because they're too scared. And I'm not just saying people within local party either. I'm saying a lot of people, a lot of high profile people that I've personally spoken to will not even step foot near this conversation, even though they have slightly different thoughts than what the narrative is, because they don't want to get attacked. They don't want to be jumped on because they know how toxic it gets. So once you've put your, you know, once you said where you stand on it, you already know that you've got certain people that are going to be against you. And so for, for a lot of people, they just remain quiet and they won't even, you know, say anything as a result of that. And that's an issue as well. There's a lot of people that just will just be like, well, it is what it is. Let's just move on. And it, and then it allows to fester and fester and fester. So if you can't even have a conversation about it because there's two people, there's people too fearful to talk about it, then how are we going to really create a solution for it? Especially if it's only going to be 
vocal minorities on both sides that are going to be calling for supposed changes or implementations of how to be done. It should be like across all of the membership to talk about how we really tackle this. But there are people that are too fearful to talk about it. So it's an unfortunate thing. And again, I want to change that kind of narrative of making sure that it's okay to ask questions as long as you're just being genuine with what you're saying. But there obviously is a line and that's where we have to work out where that line is. And that's why earlier I said we need to define clearly to some people what is and what isn't transphobia. But again, people will be even too fearful to be doing that as well. So it's it's going to be a, a long, long, long um, solution to this problem. Uh, again, it's not going to just be over one term of or two terms of an you know, a quality and diversity coordinator. It's going to take a very, very, very long time to, to sort. You're talking years, but hopefully what I can do can get that ball rolling, um, basically. And that's one of the main, one of the major reasons I'm standing. So I want to move on to something else at the moment, but before I do, just to, 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 to follow up on that slightly. So I think you've correctly identified there that obviously this, this conversation that's happening, not just within the party, but in wider society right now, is extremely difficult and unpleasant and toxic in the way that it's being handled right now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you've got the context of uh, the right wing press and the Tories trying to manufacture a culture war around trans people and a moral panic around trans rights, um, which which, just, which definitely doesn't help. Um, now, I think everybody involved in this conversation whatever position they hold agrees to an extent that this needs to be detoxified yeah the question i want to put to you though really is in terms of that um what you've described as your sort of approach to this the there'll be people watching who will be thinking well that's all well and good that you think that everyone needs to get in a room and sort of bash it out and hash it out and come to a conclusion together on this and to tease out some of these difficult things but there'll be people who'll be thinking what you're doing there is asking me as a trans person or an unbinary person to sit in the same room with someone and negotiate my rights with that person who fundamentally wants to take my rights away and so I guess the question I wanted to put to you is how how would you manage that as a space which, uh, you know, allows for difficult conversations, for mistakes to be made, whilst also protecting the the needs and rights of trans and non-binary members in the party to, you know, have their identities and their, um, you know, personhood respected and legitimised in that space? It's I'm going to be completely honest with you. That is the crux of it. That's where it becomes super difficult. That's where hopefully that motion that's been brought forward in spring conference really helps with that. Because, you know, again, we, we have a culture that's, that breeds where people feel like that. They feel like, well, I'm not even going to step into that space because I feel like there's people that don't want me to exist. There's people that feel like I shouldn't even exist as, as, a, as an entity. And, it's 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 interesting because I've seen some statistics come out saying that most British people, when it comes to like you know trans rights and the views of trans people, they they largely agree with they should exist, they should participate in society, that they, they have no issues. So these kind of things that we're seeing on you know social media, are you talking the extremes? You're talking people that either just that that's their extreme view or they're just saying it just to be you know controversial or something because they know it'll create a buzz about what around what they're saying even though like i said the majority of people kind of just want to you know them to exist they're happy with what's happening they might have some issues they might have some nigglings but again that can't that's just you know again conversations to be had so i feel like it is going to be a difficult thing. I feel like that's going to be something that I need to, you know, um, hone if I am to be elected as um, the, the diversity and equalities um, coordinator because I don't have a magic bullet for it and I don't think anyone really does at the moment. I think all we can do is really just try our best in order to to tackle it. There might be some mistakes made, but I think if there's an understanding of it's all coming from a good place, it's all coming from where we just want both sides to be sorted and to be okay with each other and to be able to be in the room with each other or to at least be on the same platform, the same conference, the same local party, regional party together without any issues. 
um like i said it's 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 too much of a um of a of a um it's too, it's too complicated just to to just to break it down as this and this and this needs to be done but hopefully i will be able to do something about it if i am um elected so the other area I wanted to talk to you about, um, and obviously we could talk about sort of all of the, you know, uh, areas in relation to college and university, we've only got a certain amount of time. The other area I wanted to focus on was around race. So for a long time, um, I've been having conversations and doing interviews with uh, people who are standing for, for elections, for internal elections, for external elections. And I've spoken to a lot of people about uh, the Green Party and race and whether or not... Um, uh, firstly, whether or not there uh, has been sufficient work done to tackle the overwhelming whiteness of the party. And secondly, uh, a number of in, in recent years, there's been a number of people who have basically a, a leveled accusations of institutional racism against the Green Party. So what I wanted to ask you is, firstly, what do you think the Green Party needs to do to um, to tackle the issues of racial diversity um, and inclusion within the party and secondly do you agree with the allegations that the party is institutionally racist um let's go with the first thing so in terms of the strategies it needs to change its political strategy in regards to target to win because from what i've been a member since what 2014 so we're coming up to nearly 10 years within the party for the majority of what I've seen, I'm not just talking about Birmingham, where my local party is, but I'm talking up and down the country. I have seen either we go for, you know, working class, right wing leaning constituencies slash wards, or we go for kind of more middle class, labor -le like left leaning, maybe labor leaning, more wards and constituencies, which is all good, but that will produce, generally speaking, more white members, more white representation within that community. I very, very rarely do I see someone coming up and going, let's go for that black, let's go for that brown community. Because again, you might find there are going to be some people that are leaning more towards right. You're going to find people that are leaning more towards left. But I feel like that in itself is something that should be tackled. I go, you know, I visit London quite regularly. Um, regularly now due to a relationship I have there and when I when I see pictures of the local London um like, you know local parties in London or regional parties in London it's full of non-white it's full of like, white people and I'm like how do you achieve that in London in places like Lambeth in Brixton in Tower Hamlets just look at if you look at past um candidates for other parties they pick people from that local community because they know that that they're getting represented by that name. They've been doing that for decades now, but we, for some reason, still struggle to do that because we. I don't, and I, at this point, it's either willful, um, it's either willful ignorance or um, or blissful ignorance at some point where we're just not going for those black and brown wards slash constituencies. We've been saying this for a long time, for the last like five years, I remember. Oh, we need to do more about diversity. We need to do more and more and more. So where's this? I mean, obviously Diverse Matters is strategies coming in, but we've been saying that before, even Diverse Matters report was done and I'm still not seeing anything, especially from a place like London. London should be leading on this. Like it's one of the biggest hubs we've got within the party is London. You know, you've got Bristol, Brighton, London. Now, we've, you know, it's, you know, Norwich is becoming another one now. Um, Sheffield's coming another one but that's where the biggest diversity is so that's where we, we should be hitting the most I've seen local no not local but um well yeah local is local kind of news about here are constituencies where um you know Labour are they've pretty much got like a major major super majority you're talking like 80 70 80 percent of the vote but we're second and it's like but the way, especially with the way Labour's going at the moment, we can easily galvanise some more black and brown support just if we were going in those areas. And I'm talking Tottenham, I'm talking Hackney, places like that, Stoke Newington. I'm talking loads of those places where they have black, um, significant black populations. 
black candidates that stand for those positions, but we're not doing so. So at some point, I've got to ask, we are being ignorant to this to this topic. Now, it's either willful or it's evil, um, willful ignorance, or we're being blissfully ignorant. But either way, we're being ignorant. And that's the issue, I would say. We need to change our strategy. So we're just going to those areas. We can't make excuses anymore, especially if we're talking about you know, duplicating our MPs and having more than one that we've got at the moment in, in, in Parliament. And, you know, and that leads me on to the second question of, you know, is the party institutionally racist? And I would say, yes, it is. Because yet again, we've been saying before in years and years and years, we've had prominent people leave the party over this. Don't forget, we've had big black and brown candidates leave the party, fall off the map, completely disappear and if you speak to them they will say because we've been raising these issues we go to leadership we go to gpex we go to gbsa or whoever is in in charge we say this 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 needs to be done in order to improve your diversity and we get ignored or we see it just not being done and that that needs to change so yes i would say so because we i don't see a strategy done i don't see actions being done from those big cities that are that have members, I'm talking London, Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, you know, Sheffield, Newcastle, etc. Now, I'll be more lenient towards those local parties that are in Middle England because most likely the population is going to be very white anyway. So, in terms of their diversity, I would say it needs to be disability, women, um, working class, you know, class status, etc. Like those kind of diversities can be increased. I remember getting asked once before about two years ago about someone from, I think it was from Nottingham, asking how to increase their diversity within their local party. I looked at their demographics and the city is 95% white when I, when I checked at the time. So I'm like, well, even if you've got, even if you've got some people in, you, the majority of you is still going to be white anyway, because that's just the demographics you have. So I would say for those that are in the more rural, those that are in the towns, smaller towns, just focus on other sort forms of diversity. So that's where, you know, you can increase the diversity there. But with London, Manchester, Birmingham, I mean, I'll hold my own local party to account on that. Other major cities, there's no excuse, especially London. There is no excuse. The amount of local parties that are big, and don't forget, those local parties are bigger than some of the city parties local city parties that we have so you're talking lambeth talking brixton like they'll be bigger than birmingham they'll be bigger than manchester they'll be bigger than liverpool but we're they're still not yielding the same results so it's like something needs to be done where it's are you doing this in a sense of where you're just being you know and if it's ignorance either way it's still institutional racism due to just the definition of what institutional racism is and that includes ignorance because people just think, oh, you're just doing it deliberately. Like that's within the definition, but also ignorance is as well. So that's why I say it is because we're being very, very ignorant on this in, in this case at the moment. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move us on to talk about some of the sort of more general GPEX um, things before we finish on my sort of slightly less serious questions. So mm -hmm. um, obviously you're standing for the Equality Diversity Coordinator position, but all of the portfolio holders on GPEX hold the wider responsibilities of the executive, which includes things like uh, the responsibility for the financial management of the party, for being the employer of staff, for having legal responsibility and so on and so on and so on. So I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about that. Yeah. Um, the first of them is obviously, given GPEX is the, um, the the governance body within the party that's responsible for financial management, um, including overseeing the budget, I wanted to ask you just what your experience is of kind of managing, managing large, complicated, overseeing large, complicated, difficult budgets. Well, I've been on GPEX before anyway, so I'm used to this. Um, I was on there about two years ago. And obviously, with, when working within schools, you get part, you get department budgets as well. So I have 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 spoken to colleagues about what, what things we need within our department as well. But I'm going to say, like I said last time, the biggest thing for GPEX to do for well for the party generally is we need we need more money. 
I'm always going to say this. We need, we talk about investment. It's a part of our policy. We talk about invest in green energy, invest in, you know, in this and invest in that, which is good. Then we need to invest in ourselves as well. We need to talk to those green corporations, those green businesses, SMEs, cooperatives that can join with us. We have a, um, you know, symbiotic relationship with them. So their business can grow. Ours can flourish as well. Well, we can really implement those kind of things that we keep talking about to win a seat in a constituency. You're talking about a quarter of our budget just to have really good standing of what we're doing, just to gain a seat. Lib Dems are about have a nearly 20 times the size of our budget. That is why they can afford to just suddenly when a by election comes in, they will literally blister the whole place full of, you know, volunteers and leaflets and really pound the streets we can't really afford that because we're on a you know in comparison a shoe shoe a shoe a shoe string budget so that's the biggest thing i would say increasing that would be the biggest thing um by far but yeah i've had experience before because been on previously on gpex and been um in departments of schools so uh, talking about how to um allocate budgets so the last of these sort of serious questions is about kind of the Green Party's political strategy. So one of the responsibilities of GPEX in parallel with the Green Party Regional Council, GPRC, is uh, sort of directing the organisation's uh, strategy in terms of its political ambitions, its electoral ambitions. What do you think the party needs to be doing right now to meet its political ambitions? Again, I'm going to refer back to my previous answer. We need more money. We need more money. We need it now. We need it fast. We need it constantly. Because, you know, we can't just rely just on membership because it's volunteers at the end of the day. So they only can give so much time to that and so much money. So um, that's one thing I'll all say. And one thing I will say, which I have seen a lot more, which I'm glad is um, more organization towards national action days. So I've been saying before, we need a full year calendar or at least at least six months or something in advance of days where we can go down to the selected court, to the selected um, constituencies. And we need to know well in advance so people can book those days off and come down and do that, which I have been seeing this year. So I'm glad that's been happening, but that should be the bare minimum. So anytime we say, here's a seat we're targeting, then at least, you know, two, three years out, we say, here's the days where everyone across the country can really come down and focus on that because that's how we won last time around that's how we won in Brighton Pavilion anyway so we need to really have that kind of mentality in terms of helping out when people are not well especially when there's not so much happening in other people's regions so they can come down and help and again just to uh, maximize our resources but again I will also say in addition to that is obviously that local party support as well it's difficult to take over a constituency when you barely have any councillors in it in the first place. I would always say, if you're going to pick a constituency to target, start with the wards. Firstly, take over the take over the wards within the constituency, grow a natural green base, and then turn it into, hopefully you then flip it into a constituency seat because you see the green, you know, green um, voters, you see green members, constantly within that area talking about talking to constituents talking to voters and eventually that culture will just cultivate naturally so those are two things i would certainly say more money actually no, three things more money more coordinate you know more coordination especially in a um in in a planning it out um you know years in advance and just making sure that if we do can con targeting a new seat that we take over the wards first before we start talking about taking over the constituency. You promised we move on to some slightly less serious ones. So to mm -hmm. kick those off, what's your favourite and least favourite Green Party policy? Ooh, um, I would say my favourite one, because obviously I'm, I'm going to be a bit biased on this because I helped with this, is the uh, reparations, the atonement and reparations on what got passed. If I'm not mistaken, in autumn conference, um, is it 20? It's 2021, wasn't it? If I'm not mistaken. So yeah. Uh, yeah. And my least favorite was uh I guess 
you know what? I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna be a bit controversial. Uh, I say controversial depends who you speak to, but of the see, we had a recent major change within the spring conference with in regards to NATO and our ch- and our change in positions for that. So I would say I'll go with that one. So you just just to clarify, so you you your least favorite is the new policy on NATO. Yeah, yeah, the new yeah. policy on NATO. Yeah. Grand. Um, what book has most inspired your politics? Ooh, I can't say one. Can I? Can I cheat and say two? <laughs> I'll let you have two. I'll let you have two. Yeah. Say two. Okay. So uh, the first one is um, "New Age of Empire." Uh, "New Age of Empire" by um, Gehindi Andrews. He's a um, Birmingham City University um, Black Studies professor. And the second one I would say is Naomi. Klein's um, On Fire as well book, which uh, both of them have really inspired my like love of like social and racial justice, but also environmental justice as well. Two absolutely brilliant writers. So definitely, if you haven't already read those, please do check them out. Uh, if you were prime minister for one day, what one policy would you change? Oh, I guess is um, change it proportional representation, because that would just be such a massive barrier for us to just overcome as much as we want to talk about you know ubi and all the other stuff which is good it will still leave us in the same position if we if that was not change we still have the same hurdles we have to go over to to maintain any sort of other green policies that i would just change on the day so i'd have to go with proportional representation because it will automatically get straight green mps i know in the dozens if that happened who is your favorite historical figure Ooh. Historical figure. Oh. Mm. Go with Malcolm X. Nice. Why 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 Malcolm? Um, he's always been very, very, very um staunch on, you know, when I mean, it comes to racial politics, and always been wary of the kind of people that say nice things to your face, but then are willing to stab you in the back when you when your back is turned. So you have to be mindful of those people that are talking a good game, but they don't back it up with their actual actions. So I like for the fact that he's that kind of person that's been preaching about that, for, what was preaching about that for quite a long time. Finally, who in the Green Party inspires you the most? Well, I mean, I could do a cop out and I say cop out answer. I could do a answer that everyone says Caroline Lucas, which because obviously that's always going to be on the top of the list. But I'm going to be a bit different and go with Cleo Lake. The reason I go with Cleo Lake is because she was a person that really showed, um, you know, gives the purest form of what Green Party politics is, which is really connecting with your community, that kind of local democracy. Before she became obviously the Bristol mayor, she was doing that. And then after that, she's still doing that. She might not have the biggest, obviously, presence within the party at the moment because she's got obviously grown a family and all that stuff got recently married had a child and that but she's still within she's still within her community still preaching that good green politics and I think that is something that we can all learn from is just making sure that we regardless of what happens here you're still staying within your um, community and helping your community I'll end it there Kapensi it's been an absolute pleasure thanks so much for joining me Thanks. It's been a really good discussion and I'm looking forward to what happens in August. So thank you all so much for watching. Uh, I have a few final things for you to do before you all leave. Uh, First of all, please, please, please do hit subscribe. I've got more interviews coming out with all the other candidates for GPEX, including the other candidates for Equality and Diversity Coordinator. The best way to make sure you don't miss them is to hit subscribe. Whilst you're down there, please let us know what you thought about this conversation in the comments. If you are able to, please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate so that we can continue to fund interviews like this and all the rest of the content content that Bright Green puts out. That's all from me today. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all very, very soon.